Chapter Thirteen of Clotel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Clotel by William Wells Brown. Chapter Thirteen: A Slave Hunting Parson. Tis too much proved that with devotion's visage and pious action, we do sugar o'er the devil himself. Shakespeare. You will no doubt be well pleased with Niper Jones said Mr. Peck, as Carlton stepped into the chaise to pay his promised visit to the ungodly man. "'Don't forget to have a religious interview with the Negroes,' remarked Georgiana, as she gave the last nod to her young convert. "'I will do my best,' returned Carlton, as the vehicle left the door. As might have been expected, Carlton met with a cordial reception at the hands of the proprietor of the Grove Farm. The servants in the great house were well-dressed and appeared as if they did not want for food. Jones knew that Carlton was from the north, and a non-slaveholder, and therefore did everything in his power to make a favorable impression on his mind. "'My negroes are well-clothed, well-fed, and not overworked,' said the slaveholder to his visitor, after the latter had been with him nearly a week. "'As far as I can see, your slaves appear to good advantage,' replied Carlton. "'But,' continued he, if it is a fair question, do you have preaching among your slaves on Sunday, Mr. Jones? No, no, returned he. I think that's all nonsense. My negroes do their own preaching. So you do permit them to have meetings? Yes, when they wish. There's some very intelligent and clever chaps among them. As tomorrow is the Sabbath, said Carlton, if you have no objection, I will attend meeting with them. Most certainly you shall, if you will do the preaching, returned the planter. Here the young man was about to decline, but he remembered the parting words of Georgiana, and he took courage and said, "'Oh, I have no objection to give the Negroes a short talk.' It was then understood that Carlton was to have a religious interview with the blacks the next day, and the young man waited with a degree of impatience for the time. In no part of the South are slaves in a more ignorant and degraded state than in the cotton, sugar, and rice districts. If they are permitted to cease labor on the Sabbath, the time is spent in hunting, fishing, or lying beneath the shade of a tree, resting for the morrow. Religious instruction is unknown in the far south, except among such men as the Rev. C. C. Jones, John Peck, and some others who regard religious instruction, such as they impart to their slaves, as calculated to make them more trustworthy and valuable as property. Jones, aware that his slaves would make rather a bad show of intelligence if questioned by Carlton, resolved to have them ready for him, and therefore gave his driver orders with regard to their preparation. Consequently, after the day's labor was over, Doggett, the driver, assembled the negroes together and said, "'Now, boys and gals, your master is coming down to the quarters to-morrow with his visitor, who is going to give you a preach, and I want you should understand what he says to you. Now many of you who came of old Virginia and Kentuck know what preaching is, and others who have been raised in these parts do not. Preaching is to tell you that you are mighty wicked and bad at heart. This I suppose you all know. But if the gentleman should ask you who made you, tell him the Lord. If he should ask if you wish to go to heaven, tell him yes. Remember that you are all Christians, all love the Lord, all want to go to heaven, all love your masters, and all love me. Now, boys and gals, I want you to show yourselves smart tomorrow. Be on your P's and Q's and Monday morning I will give you all a glass of whiskey bright and early. Agreeable to arrangement, the slaves were assembled together on Sunday morning under the large trees near the great house, and after going through another drilling from the driver, Jones and Carlton made their appearance. "'You see,' said Jones to the negroes as he approached them, "'you see, here's a gentleman that's come to talk to you about your souls, and I hope you will all pay that attention that you ought.' Jones then seated himself in one of the two chairs placed there for him and the stranger. Carlton had already selected a chapter in the Bible to read to them, which he did, after first prefacing it with some remarks of his own. Not being accustomed to speak in public, he determined, after reading the Bible, to make it more of a conversational meeting than otherwise. He therefore began asking them questions. "'Do you feel that you are a Christian?' asked he of a full-blooded negro that sat near him. "'Yes, sir,' was the response. "'You feel, then, that you shall go to heaven?' "'Yes, sir.' "'Of course you know who made you.' The man put his hand to his head and began to scratch his wool, and after a little hesitation answered, 
De overseer told us last night who made us, but indeed I forgot the gentleman's name. This reply was almost too much for Carlton, and his gravity was not a little moved. However, he bit his tongue, and turned to another man, who appeared from his looks to be more intelligent. "'Do you serve the Lord?' asked he. "'No, sir. I don't serve anybody but Mr. Jones. I never belong to anybody else.' To hide his feelings of this juncture, Carlton turned and walked to another part of the grounds, to where the women were seated, and said to a mulatto woman, who had rather an anxious countenance, "'Did you ever hear of John the Baptist?' "'Oh, yes, massa. John the Baptist. I know dat nigger very well indeed. He lives in old Kentuck, where I come from.' Carlton's gravity here gave way, and he looked at the planter and laughed right out. The old woman knew a slave near her old master's farm in Kentucky, and was ignorant enough to suppose that he was the John the Baptist inquired about. Carlton occupied the remainder of the time in reading scripture and talking to him. "'My niggers ain't shown off very well to-day,' said Jones, as he and his visitor left the grounds. "'No,' replied Carlton. "'You did not get hold of the bright ones,' continued the planter. "'So it seems,' remarked Carlton. The planter evidently felt that his neighbor, Parson Peck, would have a nut to crack over the account that Carlton would give of the ignorance of the slaves, and said and did all in his power to remove the bad impression, already made, but to no purpose. The report made by Carlton on his return amused the parson very much. It appeared to him the best reason why professed Christians, like himself, should be slaveholders. Not so was Georgiana. She did not even smile when Carlton was telling his story, but seemed sore at heart that such ignorance should prevail in their midst. The question turned upon the heathen of other lands, and the parson began to expatiate upon his own efforts in foreign missions, when his daughter, with a childlike simplicity, said, "'Send Bibles to the heathen on every distant shore, from light that's beaming o'er us, that streams increasing pour. But keep it from the millions downtrodden at our door. Send Bibles to the heathen, their famished spirits fed. O oh, haste and join your efforts, the priceless gift to speed, then flog the trembling negro if he should learn to read. I saw a curiosity while at Mr. Jones that I shall not forget soon, said Carlton. What was it? inquired the parson. A kennel of bloodhounds, and such dogs I never saw before. They were of a species between the bloodhound and the foxhound, and were ferocious, gaunt, and savage looking animals. They were part of a stock imported from Cuba, he informed me. They were kept in an iron cage and fed on Indian cornbread. This kind of food, he said, made them eager for their business. Sometimes they would give the dogs meat, but it was always after they had been chasing a negro. "'Were those the dogs you had, Papa, to hunt Harry?' asked Georgiana. "'No, my dear,' was the short reply, and the parson seemed anxious to change the conversation to something else. When Mr. Peck had left the room, Carlton spoke more freely of what he had seen, and spoke more pointedly against slavery, for he well knew that Miss Peck sympathized with him in all he felt and said. "'You mentioned about your father hunting a slave,' said Carlton, in an undertone. "'Yes,' replied she. "'Papa went with some slave-catchers and a parcel of those nasty negro dogs to hunt poor Harry. He belonged to Papa and lived on the farm. His wife lives in town, and Harry had been to see her, and did not return quite as early as he should.' and Huckleby was flogging him, and he got away and came here. I wanted Papa to keep him in town, so that he could see his wife more frequently. But he said they could not spare him from the farm, and flogged him again, and sent him back. The poor fellow knew that the overseer would punish him over again, and instead of going back he went into the woods. "'Did they catch him?' asked Carlton. "'Yes,' replied she. And chasing him through the woods he attempted to escape by swimming across a river, and the dogs were sent in after him and soon caught him. But Harry had great courage and fought the dogs. With a big club, and Papa, seeing the negro would escape from the dogs, shot at him, as he says, only to wound him, that he might be caught, but the poor fellow was killed. Overcome by relating this incident, Georgiana burst into tears. Although Mr. Peck fed and clothed his house-servants well, and treated them with a degree of kindness, he was nevertheless a most cruel master. He encouraged his driver to work the field hands from early dawn till late at night, and the good appearance of the house servants, and the preaching of Snyder to the field negroes, was to cause himself to be regarded as a Christian master. Being on a visit one day at the farm, and having with him several persons from the free states, 
and wishing to make them believe that his slaves were happy, satisfied, and contented, the parson got out the whiskey and gave each one a dram, who in return had to drink the master's health, or give a toast of some kind. The company were not a little amused at some of the sentiments given, and Peck was delighted at every indication of contentment on the part of the blacks. At last it came to Jack's turn to drink, and the master expected something good from him, because he was considered the cleverest and most witty slave on the farm. Now, said the master, as he handed Jack the cup of whiskey, now, Jack, give us something rich. You know, continued he, we have raised the finest crop of cotton that's been seen in these parts for many a day. Now give us a toast on cotton. Come, Jack, give us something to laugh at. The negro felt not a little elated at being made the hero of the occasion, and taking the whiskey in his right hand, put his left to his head and began to scratch his wool and said, The big bee flies high, the little bee make the honey, the black folks mix the cotton, and the white folks gets the money. End of chapter 13